Welcome to the Assembling Inclusion podcast. On this show, we feature different programs, individuals, and initiatives focused on being more inclusive of individual needs. We invite you to learn right alongside us. If you want some additional resources or access to our courses, please visit our website or follow us on social media. But for right now, let's get right to the episode. has always had the potential to bring people together. Today we're going to be talking about an initiative that offers an accepting and inclusive space for all musicians. Flushing Town Hall runs the Louis Armstrong Legacy Monthly Jazz Jams throughout the year, which are open to any performer. These sessions bring together professional musicians, students, or people who are just starting to play. Within this space is the ability to freely perform without judgment and while being encouraged by your fellow musicians in the audience. We talked to two individuals in this interview, Carol Sedhalter and Mimi Block. Carol is the jazz house band leader for the monthly jazz jam sessions, and Mimi Block is an accomplished violinist who frequently performs at these sessions. Both Mimi and Carol shared a little about their experiences and background within music and jazz, as well as their experiences with the sessions at Flushing Town Hall. Finally, we touch upon the importance and significance of inclusion within jazz and, more broadly, performance music. Let's dive right in to learn more from our two fantastic guests. Our first guest for today is Mimi Block. So Mimi, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you so much. So first, could you share with our listeners a little bit about your journey as a musician? What role has music played in your life? I was born with a very musical family. My mom is a pianist and a samba player. And my dad is a jazz guitarist and a teacher at a university who my mom married. I grew up listening to music at home and um, I started playing piano, but it didn't really go well. And then I started playing violin at the age of seven. And I didn't know I could sing until I met Barry Harris at the age of 16. So you have a very extensive musical background then. I didn't realize your whole entire family is in music. It's, it, it kind of works out then that you're also interested in music because it really fits yeah. into the whole dynamic. Yeah. I had saw on your website that you started playing the violin as a therapeutic tool. I was curious, what drew you to the violin specifically? This was kind of physical therapy for my fingers because my fingers didn't function well because of my autism and the piano was the first tool that I did but it didn't go well because I struggled with the location of the keys and other related things so my mom bought a violin and eventually started playing by myself and then my mom found a violin school which was next to a toy store so Because I could go to the toy store after the violin lesson, I could continue having violin lessons because I didn't actually like music or noise in my early age. I actually didn't like to hear any music because I guess it was everywhere around me. My parents are just playing a lot of music and everything and I wanted quiet and peace and I love toys. So the toy store helped me, kept going. So. And eventually my passion for music became a habit. It wasn't something special. It was like more of a habit or, or some kind of homework. It was like a requirement I have to do. I love the fact that it was next to a toy store. It's almost like an incentive to want to keep going to practice. That's great that it it kind of helped. You created this routine that worked out with music and practicing. I noticed that in high school, you studied both classical violin and jazz violin. I was wondering what attracted you to playing jazz? I know that's such a special type of music. So my dad is a jazz musician, right? He wanted me to play jazz violin a lot. Once I learned more of violin and I went to a jazz camp at the age of 12, but the jazz thing didn't really hit off until I was in high school. So in high school, I had a classical teacher who I really hated at the time because he was very strict to me and I didn't like high school at all. My school is very classical and I didn't understand 
a lot of things and I also didn't understand a lot of jazz. So it was very hard time for me to deal with classical music. So I eventually resorted to playing jazz because jazz has no rules or no limits there are no requirements you could just be free and relax and do whatever and express yourself mostly that is really nice about jazz that freedom of expression and being able to eliminate those rules that's kind of a nice contrast to the classical that you had in your high school experience and I saw that you recently won two awards, and I'm going to make sure I get the names right, the Barry Harris Performance Achievement Award and the Danny mm-hmm. Award. Could you tell us about both of those and what they mean to you? The Barry Harris Award it was mainly from me transcribing a lot of his solos and memorizing them and eventually playing some of the solos that he played through my solos and my language mostly came from his language. And I was also his student in 2019. I was at his workshop most of the time. This would probably explain why I got the award. Oh, even Barry Harris wrote a letter for my high school president to free her from suffering in high school and and he signed it. So Every Wednesday afternoon, I attended Barry Harris's orchestra, which gave me more time to talk to him and perform with him. And for the Danny Awards, I was at Sam Braun's jazz band. And when the Danny Awards happened, a newscaster came in and interviewed with me, and I was excited because I appeared on TV for the awards. So the awards are special to me because it gives me realization that I have something special with my music. Definitely. I was going to say that that's that's a big congratulations on getting both of those. Those are really great achievements and really show both your devotion to music and your musical talent as well. Mm -hmm. So I did want to ask about, I know you've been involved in the Louis Armstrong Legacy Monthly Jazz Jams. How did you get involved with that program specifically? I was involved with it after I graduated high school. And Jackie Lennon, who's the president of the International Women in Jazz, she suggested me to perform for the Jazz Jam through Zoom. And I started playing and that's how I met Carol for the very first time. So what have been some memorable moments for you in your time with the monthly Jazz Jams? How do you think the experience has impacted you? It's kind of hard to describe it, but I got to meet a lot of people who was in the jazz jam with me. And on December 8th, on the day that my mentor, Barry Harris, passed away, I had to perform for the Flushing Town Hall Jam. And that was very emotional. And I picked up, if you could see me now, it was this tribute to him. And he taught this song to Samara Joy who won a Grammy last year, and that was sobbing for her when I was 16. It is a very, I'm sure, very emotional experience then. Yeah. I wanted to open it up a little more broadly and ask, so this whole podcast obviously is about disability inclusion and accessibility. As a musician, what are your thoughts about disability inclusion within the music community? For me, the, the music industry has welcomed musicians with disabilities like me and they allow me to go places and do things I would not be able to and the supporters and the fans and other musicians are very supportive and proud of me and others and they make more proud of me who I am and I feel great performing and it gave me the opportunity to express myself more or tell the world who I am through music. I think that's a really great perspective. I like the point that you made about the freedom of expression to be who you are and the openness and acceptingness of the musical community. I could definitely see how that would be something that's that's really accurate. And my last question for you is what are some upcoming projects and plans that you have that our listeners should keep an eye out for? Because I know you're doing a whole lot of different things, but what are some new projects you have in the future? It's a little hard to explain because there's a little going on, but I'm in the ZA Ensemble at the Jazz Power Initiative, who is managed by Dr. Eli Yeming. And I appear some of the ensemble shows. And I also want to start making 
personal music project soon. I'm going to make sure mm -hmm. to link that website in our show notes so that our listeners can hop onto your website and take a look to learn more about you and kind of see what you're doing and keep updated on your musical progress and your musical journey. I wanted to give thanks. I wanted to thank the Jazz Power Initiative faculty, including my mentors, Antoinette Montague. And I also want to thank the Barry Harris Workshop and Phil Bingham, who was a conductor for Barry Harris's orchestra. It's a pleasure to be here. and Thank you so much. I want to thank you, Mimi, for joining us and telling us all about your background and your experiences with music and the impact it's had on your life. Thank you so much for being here. It was so great to talk to you and to learn more about your experiences. Yep. Thank you so much. So now we're going to transition to talk to Carol Sudhalter, the jazz house band leader for the monthly jam sessions. So Carol, thank you for being here today. Thank you. It's great to be here. So I'm going to start off with the same question. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background in music? Yeah, it's so similar to what Mimi was saying. I also come from a family of musicians. My father was a great saxophonist who, who started on violin. And my oldest brother was a trumpet player who became quite famous, both as an author and a swing trumpet player. My uncle was a saxophonist and my other brother was a sax player. It goes way back many generations. So I heard jazz since I was quite young, but I didn't think that I would become a musician. I was a biology major. I wanted to be a science writer. Well, that's an interesting transition then from biology to music. <laughs> it changed while I was in college. My poor father, you know, he was, <laughs> he was beside himself. <laughs> It's hard to stay away from the things that you that you are, are drawn to. <laughs> That's true. I think I probably didn't want to be in the shadows of all the others. And I did love biology and nature since I was little. So suddenly, because I started therapy when I was 20, and my true self began to come out and grab me. I want to jump to ask you about the... We talked a little bit about it with Mimi, but the, the Louis Armstrong Legacy Monthly Jazz Jams. Can you explain what they are and how they're unique to the jazz community? It's just something I really love and I'm just honored to be in it. Jam sessions are basically an integral part of learning to play. You study a tune and then you want to try it out somewhere and that's the perfect place to do it. You don't want to try it out when you're performing somewhere you know, at a, at a club or something. And so you bring it there and then you see what's wrong and, and so forth. So jam sessions go on all over the world. And many, many jazz clubs in New York hold jam sessions after hours. And that's always been a tradition that musicians would go to their gigs. And then when they finished the gig, they would go over to the jam session and see their friends and play and have a great time. Now, this jam session, I was asked to lead it. It was 2016 when I started, and it went on a few years before that. First of all, the name tells you that we do pay tribute to, always to the great teachings of Louis Armstrong, sort of the grandfather of all of us. And we try to bring in at least a tune or two each month that, that he played and recorded. And it's somehow connected to him, but we also remember his spirit and everybody there does. It's unique. It's unique in being super supportive and friendly. I, I appreciate that. When I had heard about it, I, I was really drawn to the fact that it was so accepting, which I thought was really great from, from an inclusion perspective, which we'll touch on in a little bit. So and this might be a question that's more because I haven't been in the musical world since I was in elementary school. I cannot carry a tune and I cannot play instruments very well. This is not one of my talents. So I give you and Mimi a lot of credit for being so strong as musicians. But as the jazz house band leader, what is your role and responsibility within those monthly jam sessions that occur? Well, it was a perfect fit for me because a big part of it is being a good organizer. And that's something that's kind of in my birth sign. I love to organize. So for example, you might have 30 people sign up to play and you've only got three hours, take away 
20 minutes of introduction and house band and 10 minutes of the break, you have maybe two and a half hours to work with and you have to fit all those people in. So I have to really keep on top of the organizational aspect of it. And it would be just dreadful if, if somebody ended up not having a chance to play after waiting around. So that's part of it. And the other part is, I mean, I hired the house band. They're excellent musicians. And I have to, you know, check up, make sure they're all free to come, get them paid, let them know what, what we're going to do as our first tune, our second tune, when we feature the house band, and keep good track of everything. But it's more than that. I mean, those are some of the things that are outstanding for me that make it, like I say, a really good fit. And I was very excited when they called me. Somebody who knew me pretty well, I guess, had recommended me for this and knew that it was going to be a good fit. I'm learning more about that now, about where it started. Other jam sessions can be very competitive. People could do things like, in my experience, they could purposely set the tempo to a tune so fast that only the most pro musicians could cut it and the rest of us would make fools of ourselves. They could call a tune in a different key or they could just kind of ignore you and not really make you feel welcome. Or for instance, like the first time I went to a jam session in Israel, which was back in the late 60s, you know, women weren't so accepted. So they saw me come in and I asked if I could play and they said, well, what kind of music do you play? Well, it was a jazz session. So why would I walk in if I didn't play? They actually meant it. So you can get all kinds of attitudes and it would be more discouraging than anything. And this particular jam session is completely free of all that garbage. It's really garbage free. Everyone is welcome. Everyone gets a welcome. The audience is exceptionally welcoming. I, I have heard people come in that played awful notes and no control. And the audience just cheered and commented and said, yeah, go for it. That's a really big contrast then for what's typical of just jam sessions. I didn't realize that they could be that difficult and challenging. So that makes it even more special then that this space really allows people to explore because I think you, you had mentioned earlier that the purpose is to try out new things within a safe space. So it makes sense that this is this kind of nice welcoming space where people can try things and maybe it doesn't work or they can figure out how to fine tune things in a space that is inviting and welcoming, which leads into, so how do you think the monthly jazz jams then celebrate diversity and inclusion? I'm assuming just because of the space being so welcoming and you know encouraging, but I was just curious what your thoughts were. Yeah, it's a difficult question and I've thought about it. I think that we really are not allowed, so to speak, we know it's not cool to ask someone where they're from, what their background is, what's wrong with them, it's just not something that Flushing does as a general institution. It's a liberal institution and it sticks to that integrity. So I think that in itself is very freeing. I think that's where it lies. I don't think I could say how is it particularly, especially supportive to one disability or another, because I think it's just an overall atmosphere and policy. That makes sense. It's not catering to one specific identity or disability. It's just overall a welcoming place for anybody in any walk of life, any experience. And once it's known as such, I think it automatically attracts people who believe that way, who live that way, and people who know that they will be welcomed. And yeah, I could, I could see that just from your explanation of it. I could see that this is probably beneficial for all, any, any participant to walk in because they know that it's going to be a safe, encouraging, inviting place for them. But they don't have to explain themselves. They can just be who they are and play. And certainly in the field of jazz, it is true what Mimi said, which is that regardless of disabilities, if you can play, you can rise to the top. There's been famous band leaders like, I think it was Chick Webb and a famous pianist, Michelle Petruzzani, 
and many others who were really disabled physically, and then others who have severe emotional and mental situations. There's one very famous trumpet player who, as far as I've ever seen, cannot speak a word, but when he plays, he's one of the most famous in the whole world, and everybody absolutely reveres him. So I think it's really very true the way she described it. Yeah, I was going to say her, her explanation really cemented it, that freedom of expression and that you can be who you are through the music and not have to follow these like rigid rules and structures and you can just express yourself freely. So that makes it even more beneficial than that it's a type of music where you can freely express yourself and you're being openly accepted by this community. I, I, I could see how that's really helpful for any, anybody getting up on that stage and performing in front of the audience. At the same time, it is not true that there are no rules. I mean, <laughs> there's a structure and you really have to know the structure before you can feel free in the tune. <laughs> that makes sense. I, w- I taught English for a long time. So I always, I always equated that to poetry. Like you have to know the rules before you can break the rules. I'm assuming jazz is probably similar. <laughs> Got to know a little bit of meter, a little bit of grammar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know anything about music, but with Mimi's background and your background, you both know enough about the music industry that you can go in then and freely express through jazz, which is great. (laughs) So I noticed that the program celebrated 10 years in 2021. So we're just a little bit beyond the 10 year mark. So what have been some of the big highlights from this monthly event and how has the program evolved over the years? I came in in 2016, but before that, I think it started with Queens College sending people to perform up there and then somebody else took over before me he's a friend of mine and then I guess it was time for a change and they called me but I think I could safely say that it's grown a lot in attendance I don't have a statistics but I see that very often we have a full house and every seat is taken you know audience wise and I think that people do come from other boroughs at all ages, all levels. We see high school, we see very, very senior. We see lots of, lots and lots of different musicians, some professionals, some amateur. I, I think it has grown quite a bit and it's got itself a very good reputation. I'm not sure how true any of that was before, but I, I myself feel that I've seen it grow. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm sure. And and you've been there since 2016. So you've seen the growth firsthand then. And this is just a random question. I was curious, do the same performers kind of come back month after month? Does it vary? Do they kind of perform some months and not others? We do have some who return quite often, if not every month, then whenever they can. And some will even call me and say, I wanted to come, but I can't make it. But there's always a mix of some we already know and some new. That's, okay. that's and it's a very nice thing it works well well that's nice thing because you're getting some of the new voices the new people in there but you're also still supporting the musicians that have been there that's true so once a year i don't know if you've heard about this but we had this, this event in july we started this three years ago we have something called the jazz jam all-star concert out of all the people that have attended in the past year or in the past few months, we look at who has had regular attendance as a number one point, and secondly, has shown you know marked improvement, and thirdly, has a great attitude of sharing. And we pick 10 of those people and ask them to give their own concert. They also get paid an honorarium, and we accompany them as we normally do at the jam. And we had that in July instead of the jam. And it's quite a big honor for them. And again, it was a big mixture of professionals and completely different professions. Oh, that's really awesome. I didn't know about that. It's just hard to just pick 10. I mean, you want to get 11, 12, 15, you just can't do it. So it went really well this year and it's always gone well. It's just a beautiful thing. They get dressed up and we have a group picture. It's just a great thing. And that's every July, you said? Not always July. Sometimes it's August. It just depends what's going on at Flushing. It's usually but, like the yeah, summer-ish. Was, yeah. And then we took a group picture on the front steps and it got a lot of good promotion and publicity. There's a oh, lot of fun. Cool. 
a lot of good photographs from it too. I'll have to see if I can find an article about it and I'll put that in the show notes too. And we have a great, great house band. The drummer is Scott Newman. The bass player is Eric Lemon and the piano player is Joe Vincent Tranquino. They're all incredibly accomplished musicians. And, you know, when people come and participate in the jam, they're just very excited to play with these people. You know, it's quite an honor. It's, it's just quite exciting. Oh, I'm sure that has to be a really exciting experience. It, it, it's a very professional sounding experience, even though everybody's at different levels, which I think is really cool. And I play tenor and baritone sax and flute, but I, I'll bring usually one sax and one flute and a flute. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So my last question for you is, so if an individual is listening and they're in the area and they want to get involved with the monthly jazz jam sessions, either as, either as a performer or as an audience member, um, what's the process for getting involved? The first thing is that you don't have to call in advance. It won't do any good. You just show up. But since there's a list, I just go down the list in order because I've been to jams where they arbitrarily call from the list not in order and that's pretty annoying so I do call people in order if they don't want to stay a long time they should get there pretty far ahead of time to sign the list early and parking is a problem over there so you have to leave time so that's the one thing they should always check the website because flushing is very organized I find with their website and maybe you have to navigate a lot because there's so much stuff, but they put in keywords like Louis Armstrong jazz jam, monthly jam, whatever. They'll see to make sure that it's being held on the second Wednesday, which is what it usually is from seven to 10. They'll see if that's in order or if there has been any change, rarely changed, but you never know. And then just to get there early, if you want to play early. And otherwise, if you don't mind, it's great listening to all the players. Then you can just get there anytime and you'll get to play no matter what. Oh, that's great. And I'll put the Flushing website in the show notes to try to make it a little easier for people to navigate and check out. That way they can have somewhere to directly go if anybody's listening is interested. And, a, and if you're an audience member, you can kind of just show up, right? This is a small charge. I think it might be $10 or something. Musicians who participate don't have to play anything. But audience, you can just show up and we will find a seat for you it's an l-shaped room and if we got overloaded we could go upstairs we have a bigger hall upstairs so it's fine and again i mean about the inclusion aspect i hope i didn't skim over it too lightly but thinking back i mean we have had people with every kind of obstacle and disability that i can think of and no one gave up or left i mean everyone has had a very comfortable time of it you know physical mental emotional vision everything and i think everyone has been very comfortable and i think that makes sense based on how you explained how accepting and encouraging everyone is it's great that this space kind of exists where people can feel comfortable going and expressing themselves through music regardless of what their disability their need might be, they can still come together and express themselves and perform. I think that's really a great message. <laughs> I, hear, I even hear stories sometimes where I wasn't even aware that some audience member took one of the performers aside to have a talk with them and tell them how good they were and what they should do to keep going. Oh, I'm sure it's encouraging to get that feedback. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they just take them aside and do that. Well, it sounds like a really great environment and I'll, I'll again, make sure to link everything in the show notes, but I want to thank you, Carol, for sharing your work and your experience with those monthly jazz jams. And thank you for being here with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Assembling Inclusion podcast. I hope the information in this episode taught you something new gave you a new idea, or showcase a new perspective. If you liked the episode, feel free to leave us a review or comment. If you have a recommendation for an individual or an organization who would make a great guest, you can message us on Twitter or Instagram, or send us an email at assemblinginclusion at gmail.com. See you next time.